Hello and welcome. This is the CircuitPython Weekly for June 20th, 2023. This is the time of the week we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Scott and I'm so sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. If you don't know, CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, uh, please consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday like it did yesterday. In the notes doc, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There's a notes document to accompany the meeting and the recording. The final notes document includes timestamps to go along with the video so you can use the doc to skip around and view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run 45 to 60 minutes. After each meeting, we post a link for the next meeting's notes doc to the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the fo uh, following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. Uh, this meeting is held in five parts. Uh, the first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview, usually, of the Python on Microcontrollers newsletter, but because today's Tuesday, it's actually uh, the, the top bits of the newsletter when it, that went out this morning. The second part is the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. This is a quantitative overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from our status updates and subjective opinions. Uh, the third part is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things folks are doing, taking the time to recognize the awesome folks in our community. Fourth is Status Updates. It's an opportunity to report on what we've been up to. Take a couple of minutes and talk about what you've been doing in the last week, uh, since the last meeting, what you'll be up to the next week. Lastly is In the Weeds. It's an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These uh, discussions can come out of status updates, um, but are more commonly something you've identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. Um, if you have topics, please drop them in the in the weeds section in the notes document, and we go through the list there as well. That how that covers how the meeting will go, and I will switch docs here and take a timestamp and go into community news. So. Uh, community news is a section for all things uh, Python on hardware. It's a preview of our Python on hardware newsletter that goes out every week. Um, like I said before, this is uh, actually what was in the newsletter that was sent out this morning. Um, so first up, Bluetooth arrives for the Raspberry Pi Pico W. A year after the Pi Pico W was launched with its Infineon CYW43439 wireless chip, Raspberry Pi has software to enable Bluetooth for their SC SDK version 1.5.1 and in MicroPython. CircuitPython support will follow in time, meaning we don't know when we're going to do it. Uh, quote, specifically, we support Bluetooth Classic with the temporary exception of AC, ACL and SEO, uh, along with both the BLE central and peripheral roles. Things are also configurable so you can enable Bluetooth Classic and BLE either individually or both have them available at the same time. And that's for the SDK. That is not, not the supported stuff for CircuitPython right now. OK. Uh, next up, uh, testing the performance of spy-based LCD displays and display I.O. in CircuitPython. Uh, and this I found, I think, through somebody on the Discord. So thank you to them. Uh, Josh gets a wave share around LCD and measures the response time of drawing the design above with CircuitPython and Display.io. It's at Josh on Design. And the conclusion is basically that Spy, spy is the limitation to, do, to doing full screen refreshes. Um, all right, next up. The EuroPython 2023 schedule has been finalized. EuroPython 2023 will be July 17th through the 23rd in Prague and remote. The list of sessions is available uh, with the selected talk, tutorials, and posters are out now. And there's a bunch of links there. 
Next up. Five. Espressive issues a free book on the ESP32 C3. Uh, it, Espressive has released a new book on their ESP32 C3 microcontroller. The free book is 400 pages and available as a PDF uh, from Espressive. And with that, uh, let's wrap up with the details of the newsletter. The CircuitPython Weekly Newsletter is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available at adafruitdaily.com slash category slash CircuitPython. It highlights the latest Python on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. Uh, to contrib contribute your own news or project, edit next week's draft on GitHub or submit a pull and support submit a pull request there. You may also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. And with that, let's move on to the state of CircuitPython libraries in Blinka. Um, this report contains information from seven days before yesterday. Because we're on a Tuesday, I decided to pull the notes from yesterday. Um, any changes, PRs, merge issues uh, that were yesterday or today will be uh, included in this report. Uh, but I did that because usually it's on Mondays. So next Monday, we'll include stats from today and yesterday. All right. Uh, overall, we had eight pull requests merged from six different authors. Thank you to them. Breaker Sun is a new author to me there, so highlights to them. Uh, five reviewers uh, supported those six authors, so thank you to all the, re re the reviewers. Overall, issue-wise, we had eight closed issues by seven people and 12 opened by 11 people, so we're net up four. And a, a good chunk, you know, somewhat into the double digits of folks that are working on that. Next up, the, the numbers or the sub numbers for the core. We had full pull, four pull requests merged uh, from three authors and four reviewers. Uh, we have 22 open pull requests, which is uh, kind of under my benchmark of fitting all on the first page. Uh, we have five closed issues by four people and three open by three people. So we're net down two, which is great, for a total of 657 open issues. We have seven active milestones, uh, the most urgent one. Milestones are used to, to prioritize the work for the folks that are funded by Adafruit, generally. So if there are issues that you'd like to work on that have been marked long term, feel free to do that. We're so happy to help you do that and, uh, and do the review. It's just that we, uh, we may not do the work ourselves, we being Adafruit funded folks. Um, so as of yesterday morning or whenever this ran, uh, we had one open issue for 8.2, which is kind of like the most imminent thing. Uh, we had 36 open issues for 8xx and 30 open issues for 9.0. Um, I think our intention is to go through the 8xx issues this week um, so that we can either bundle them in 9.0 or 8.2 um, because we want to get 8.2 out pretty soon. And with that, let's uh, kick it over to Katni for an update on the libraries. Let's watch Katni scroll back to the spot where I'm supposed uh, to be reading from. I know. That's, I, I have to do that too. <laughs> all right. So this section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries and all of the libraries in the community bundle. So across all of those, we had four pull requests merged from three different authors and four different reviewers. And uh, three of those four were 13 days or older, so it's good to see we're getting through some older PRs as well. And that leaves us with 58 open pull requests. We had three closed issues by three people and seven open by six people, leaving us with 619 open issues. 46 of those are labeled good first issue. Um, I'm not gonna go through the whole spiel today because my throat is obviously not happy. Uh, but if you're interested in contributing, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing, all kinds of info there, and we're always available to help. In terms of library PyPI weekly download stats, we had across all, across 310 libraries, 159,819, and the top 10 downloads are available in the notes. The numbers are surprisingly low this week, um, for the top ones, um, but actually pretty high for the because there's, there's a top like three of them that are constantly downloaded and then the rest of them change up and the rest of them are a little mm -hmm. bit high. So interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then in terms of the library updates in the last seven days, we had two updated libraries. They're in the notes. Uh, we had no new libraries this week and that's where we are with the libraries.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Katni. Next up, let's go to Maker Melissa for Blinka update. Hello. Um, for Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for um, uh, for MicroPython, uh, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers, we had uh, zero pull requests merge this week. There are currently three open pull requests and amongst other repositories, and there were zero closed issues and two open by two people. Uh, there are currently 96 open issues. There were 11,705 PyPI downloads in the last week, 6,538 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are at 119 boards that we support. And that's awesome. it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. All right. Next up, let's go to our next section, which is hug reports. This is done as a round robin. Uh, I will start as the host, and then we'll go through the folks listed in the uh, notes document. If folks are marked as uh, not available, I'll read for them. Um, hug reports are, are a chance for us to say thank you to folks for the work that they've been doing within the community or even outside the community, just highlighting cool things that people are doing and thanking them for it. Uh, all right, so for me, a hug to Jeff again for the collab on the Swirl Grid. Um, I, I, I got uh, one of them when I was in New York last week, and I'm excited to see it in the shop, I think, today, hopefully. Um, and also a hug to Foamy Guy for continuing to debug in the weeds of Display.io. Display.io is very complicated, especially with all of the different tracking stuff. And so I really appreciate Foamy, Foamy Guy digging into that and uh, fix, fixing some issues. With that, let's go to Dan. Okay, thanks to you, Scott, for um, meeting up in New York City. And we had a lot of good discussions about many CircuitPython things. Um, uh, taking a lot of walks around the city, too. Uh, thanks to Jimmo for pointing out a confusion of mine about um, MicroPython has this new feature where you can uh, sort of store MPY files in a special kind of file system um, to make them executable directly from Flash, um, but they don't have to be frozen. Uh, and I misunderstood something about that. And so he pointed out uh, where I went wrong about that. Okay. That's it. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is DJ Devin three. Thank you. I have a hug to Foamy Guy for some great advice on improving the bitmap saver library examples. And I'll echo what Scott said uh, about him deep diving into the display IO stuff. I know he's still going to be doing that this week. So I'm excited to watch him uh, dive further into the, the request that was in the weeds, you know, issues from a couple weeks ago. Uh, it's very, very interesting, and I'm hoping to learn a lot from that. Uh, a, a hug to Ventru and Herbrain for helping with advice in 3D printing Discord channel. They've both been very active and very helpful lately. Uh, a hug to Tyeth for helping in the Adafruit IO Discord channel with specifically with CircuitPython MQTT questions, uh, mm -hmm. which is uh, like you have to go through one layer of CircuitPython and then MQTT is, is adds another layer of complexity. So by the time you get there, you really need someone that's already been there, done that, and, and Tyeth mm -hmm. has uh, been very helpful with that. That's it. Awesome. Thank you so much, DJ Devin3. Uh, next up, I will read for Foamy Guy, who's missing the meeting. Uh, Foamy Guy says, a hug report to Dan for discussion and points in the right direction about the ESP32 spy socket compatibility. Uh, hug to Vladek uh, for troubleshooting mini MQTT issues and submitting proposed fixes. Hugs to Seagrover, David Glaub, and others for his discussion and ideas about the Enigma Machine Macro, pro macro Pad project I was working on during my stream. And next up, let's go to Jepler. Hello. Uh, I have a group hug for y'all and a hug for John Park for doing some research um, and selecting a piece of software called Rhubarb that will turn an audio file into mouth positions. And that has to do with this Teddy Ruxpin project that I've been working on um, that Lady Ada looped me in on. So yeah, uh, that's what I got. Cool. I'm excited to, to see that and hear more about Rhubarb. <laughs> All right, next up is Katni. 
of course, I wrote a novel on the day that I shouldn't be talking much. Okay, so first of all, uh, this was actually from uh, last week, but I wasn't in the meeting, so I pasted into this week. Uh, thank you to all of the Discord helpers. That's everybody in a in a helper's role uh, for pro providing such an amazing amount of help on the server and for always being cognizant of potential issues and bringing them to mod attention and having incredibly thoughtful discussions about all sorts of things that have helped me adapt the server to make it better to serve the community. Um, so this big one is for everyone involved with the CircuitPython project. This past Saturday, I gave my dad uh, my Canary Nightlight, the guide I recently wrote, um, gave him the hardware and setup for it. And af after he found the guide and expressed interest in it in a use case, I did not think to update the Wi-Fi credentials or the Adafruit IO credentials. So when I gave it to him, I said I would call him the next day and walk him through changing it. Naturally, the process turned into an ordeal, don't they always? Um, I had him download uh, Mew first, forgetting that uh, we were trying to update the .toml file and not the code.py, but it turned out to be good that we had this. First of all, um, the Wi-Fi error auto reset timing was five seconds. So as it was, the board was rebooting every five seconds um, because it couldn't connect to Wi-Fi which meant uh, connecting to the board was not viable. Mm. And so I walked him through putting it in safe mode. We tried to update settings.toml only to find out the permissions were corrupted. So I had him create a new settings.toml file, but I also had to walk through the right click get info way of removing the .txt extension because text that it was being helpful. Uh, back into safe mode, copy the file over, reset again, still rebooting. Back into safe mode, walked him through changing all of the error timings to 60 seconds with outline numbers because I forgot that I had modified the code with no local copy of it here. Um, I explained serial in Mew and finally found out the error. Turns out the SSID was wrong. Uh, put it into the REPL to stop it from resetting while he fixed the SSID and settings.toml, reloaded, and it worked. I had him change all the error resets back to 10 seconds. Restart still worked. All of this took about an hour. This is literally the first time he's ever touched code or microcontrollers other than interacting with fully functional demos. The point of this ridiculously long hug story is to explain the reason behind my hug here. I was able to walk my dad through this ordeal and get the project working without all of the work we've put into making Super Py or Circuit Python super approachable and easy to use. There's no way that this would have happened. So thank you to everyone who's contributed to building the amazing thing we have here. You all made this moment possible. And finally, I have a hug for my dad. I'm so unbelievably proud of him for sticking with me through everything above and he even asked periodic questions so he could actually understand what was going on to try and learn things as well. And that's what I've got. Awesome. That That is like the the goal, right? Is like when you hit trouble, try you, you don't get so turned off that you that you stop. So that's awesome. Exactly. To, to like we, we want that first five minutes to work out for folks, but eventually there's going to be problems. Yeah. And we don't want to awesome. lose folks over over issues. So totally. Well, thanks for the story. All right. And last up, we have maker Melissa. Hello, uh, I wanted to give a hug to Katni for some good suggestions on updating a guide and for Liz for uh, taking on uh, making the guide changes and then a group hug for everyone. Thank you, Melissa. Next up, we have status updates. We do this in a similar format as to hug reports, but this time we want to hear what you've been working on in the past week and what you plan on working on in the coming week. Uh, I'll start and then we'll go through the list just like last time. Um, for me, let me take a time code. Uh, I'm back from New York City. Uh, I'm getting caught up on stuff and then digging into USB host is the, is the big thing I'm trying to get back to. Um, I've been poking the LLD, which is the LLVM linker a bit to bring some size numbers to the LLVM embedded meeting, uh, which is Thursday morning. Um, I'm trying to find somebody there that is interested in, in kind of like complimenting me and helping me get uh, LLVM and the, and the compiler tooling stuff uh, good enough so that we could switch to it for CircuitPython, which is, is not the case currently. Um, and then I was just talking with Lamore this morning and she's also interested in, uh, some more swirl grid sizes because they're very easy to order from JLC PCB and, uh, stock in the store. So she's excited about that. I'm excited about it. And so if you have ideas on, on particular sizes you'd like to see, uh, let me know. Um, 
DJ Devin, why don't we put that in the weeds asking for a request of LLD and LLVM. So LLVM is a, it's Clang is part of it, which it's an alternative to GCC. That's the fastest way to say it. Uh, okay, Dan H, you're up next. Okay, um, oops, I've lost my, here we go. Uh, go on to the next person because I lost my. Um... Okay. Your tab. All right, we'll circle back to Dan. Let's go to DJ Devin three. Okay. Uh, this week I updated some bitmap saver examples to be more robust and helping to avoid SD card data corruption. Uh, again, thank you to Foamy Guy for the suggestions to make that even better. Uh, I push three new API examples into the Adafruit requests uh, library for OpenSky Networks, which is a public flight database of active commercial aircraft. You can track one specific, there's three separate examples, so you can track one specific aircraft or all aircraft in a small geographic uh, region using lat and lon uh, coordinates. It can return a lot of data, so it's only recommended for microcontrollers with M4 or better MCUs preferably S2, S3 kind of thing. Uh, you know, a Metro M7 would be fine. Um, user Timex 40s project has already been featured in the Adafruit blog, if you want to see a great example of what it can do. His example uses a Pi portal, um, which, as everybody know, kind of has like its own portal base kind of thing. So I wrote it to be an API to be available for any circuit Python device capable of handling a large JSON data stream using the Adafruit request library. Uh, this week I had family visit and they helped me accomplish more tasks in one week than I could have done by myself in months. So having family over this week, you know, during, you know, a situation has been extremely helpful. And I just want to send a shout out to my brother for being very helpful. Um, and that's just personal news. So thank you very much. And that's all I got. All right. Thank you, DJ Devin three. Um, know what LLD stands for. I don't think it's the little drive. Um, okay, let's go back to Dan. Okay, I was looking for the swirl boards and new products and I accidentally overrode <laughs> my... <laughs> it's not in new products yet at this second. Okay, so... There was, uh, a, there was a, an, a minute long video posted. Just... Oh, good. Yeah. Um... And I, so I'm continuing to work on the micro, or I'm going to restart working on the MicroPython v1.19.1 merge. And as Scott mentioned, uh, and I mentioned already, we were in New York. I was there Thursday to Saturday. He was there a little longer. Um, it was great to see everyone, including um, the baby and Lamore and Phil. Okay. Okay. All right. Next up, I have notes from Foamy Guy to read. I got a little distracted posting that <laughs> that video, but I'm I'm excited to see stuff mounted to those boards. Uh, okay, so Foamy Guy says cleaned up the current state of the hidden tile grid issue PR and completed more thorough testing of the problem reproducer and other scripts. Uh, testing the ESP32 spy socket compatibility change in conjunction with Mini MQTT, HTTP server, and the Whiskey. Whiskey libraries. Um, I created a PR proposal to move the ESP32 spy whiskey server module over to the whiskey library and update it to work with the new compatible socket version. Started coding an Enigma machine app for the macro pad. It has a basic UI and controls utilizing the buttons and rotary knob to configure the machine settings, then allows the user to run text through the machine and type out the result over HID slash keyboard. And next up is Jepler. Hello. I have to get back to my notes because I was trying to look up the info for uh, DJ Demon 3. But anyway, um, mostly I've been up to non circuit Python work lately. Uh, last week, I finished and published a retro computing project based on Run CPM. And there's a link to that in the Learn Guide, or link, link to that Learn Guide in the notes doc. You can check that out. And the other thing I've been working on is the Teddy Ruxpin project. And the thing that I've done is um, 
create support for patching uh, different mouth movements into a Teddy Ruxpin story. So uh, Lady Ada has done the substituting a different audio file and I've done substituting different mouth movements and then when we combine that with JP's uh, use of the rhubarb software to turn your audio file into mouth positions, hopefully Teddy will start to move its mouth in time with the words that it's speaking and that'll be pretty cool. Um, so this week I'm trying to make all these different data sources come together. Um, I'll do something else when I get done with that. I'm not exactly sure what. And uh, based on the Run CPM project, um, one of the things that I did was created a USB keyboard to UART serial interface that is half of the, the Run CPM computer. And I'm really itching to do that with CircuitPython, where probably uh, that uh, default UART RX pin would be treated as the console in, and you put that on a uh, DVI feather and, and plug in a keyboard, and now you've got a whole CircuitPython workstation, and that would be pretty cool as well. And the last thing is I bought the Zelda game by accident, and now I just spend all my time playing it. So these other things are things I dream of doing, but what I will be doing is, uh, you know, looking for ingredients and, and things like that in Zelda, building <laughs> things. That's what's up with me. Thanks, Jeff. It sounds like we're we're very much thinking about the same USB keyboard to serial thing, so we should sync up with that. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, yeah. And I'm really excited. I said this in the text. I'm really excited to hear about the grid going in the store. I didn't know it was moving that fast. So cool. Yeah, I had encouraged Lamore to buy just to like five of them to to check them out, and then she like they made them really fast or something, or she didn't get around to canceling it, so she ended up getting two hundred and something of them. All right, cool. Um, so she she's got a bunch, and we looked at them, and they look good. You can see them in the video. Um, mm -hmm. But if you yeah. have any ideas for them, I'm gonna generate some more files for different sizes. So I was gonna put like a version number and uh, Adafruit logo maybe um, on here as well. Yeah. I was I was just thinking, you know, what are some IKEA product sizes that you might want to put a board in? But that was kind of the first mm -hmm. random thought I had. But that's all I got right now. I think I think I decided I want to do a one by two one so you can use it to connect other ones together. You can use the one by two to like bridge between two larger ones. Uh, so yeah, I have a I have a whole list that we're we're brainstorming, and we'll see which ones we we actually want to buy. Okay, uh, next up is Katni. Hello. So last week published the Neo Key Breakouts Guide and the TRRS Jack Breakout Guide. Uh, started on the I2S BFF Guide. Um, this week I'll be finishing up the I2S BFF Guide, and I think next up is the STEMI QT Gamepad Guide. Um, this past weekend, uh, I recently got a new split keyboard, which does not have a numpad. I thought initially it might be helpful to have one in case I wanted it. So I decided I would build one. Well, I've had the keyboard for a week or two now, and it turns out I use the numpad way more than I realized. So now it's kind of critical. I already had gathered what I needed for the build, but hadn't started it. This past weekend, I soldered it all up, the method for which turned out to have a learning curve, uh, and then got that good to go, tested it with code, it mostly worked. Um, I had one missing wire and one wire in the wrong place and then, uh, got that going correctly, figured out the code cause you got to do some stuff cause the numpad is, um, not necessarily a, a straight up, uh, four by five matrix. There are two U keys in it. So you have to deal with kind of having phantom keys, if you will, um, in the code. And then, um, everything seems to be working. So. I am, we're now working on the 3D printed case for it, the design for which is nearly completed. We're getting close. I don't know whether there's going to be a guide for this or not, but I'll post pictures somewhere at least, and I will consider posting the code and the model files in a repo as well. And that's what I've got. Sounds good. Thank you, Katni. All right, last up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Um, last week I tested out a bunch of guides related to the matrix portal. I uh, worked on fixing uh, code on the guides that failed, and I'm also working on a large guide update that requires a uh, circuit redesign and 3D print uh, design change. Uh, and this week, I'm going to work on finishing that large guide update, as, and then I'll 
work on updating the 1.2 inch seven segment display guide. And another news, I uh, participated in my first speed cubing competition this past weekend, which is basically solving Rubik's cubes as fast as possible. Hmm. And that's it. How did you do? Uh, not too bad. I got, uh, I actually got a personal record and I uh, got myself timed down to about 30 seconds. Wow. That's awesome. Thanks. Congrats. I don't think I can solve them at all. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. I've been doing it since uh, November and so it's been getting a little faster each time. Nice. Well, congrats yeah. and keep us posted on your, on your PRs there. Okay. Thanks. All right. And that's it for status updates. Uh, thank you everybody for participating. Uh, the last section we have here is called In the Weeds. It's a chance for us to have any uh, more long form discussions uh, that we kind of skipped over previously. Uh, we have one in the notes here. And then I did mention another with Jeff, but I don't know if we actually want to do that here. So first, let's do DJ Devin 3. OK, I had a brief discussion with Foamy Guy about Adafruit request examples changing to settings.toml and not to use secrets.py um, anymore. As long as 9.0 is planned to be a major breaking change, is it time to swap all online examples to settings.toml? I uh, would like opinions and guidance as any new Adafruit request API examples that I or anyone else contributes kind of have to make a choice whether it's going to be, you know, have that integrated uh, with secrets.py or settings.toml. Um, uh, and this will have, you know, breaking changes going forward as most learn guides would probably be um, affected as well. Basically anything that requires an online project, you know, you have to choose one or the other. Um, so far it's been optional and, you know, in the future you can always use a PI file anyway. Um, but I would like some guidance, you know, is it time for us to start swapping the API examples to settings.toml or I, I have no idea. So I would like, you know, some kind of discussion about, you know, do we do this for 9.0 or just keep it as is? That's it. Katney, do you have thoughts? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, 100% we need to be changing this. Um, it, yeah, I mean, we, we do, we do need to be changes. This is the crossover time. So it, you know, set, se secrets stop high. I don't, is, does it even still work in eight? I don't recall. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Is nine when we're not going to make it work anymore? It's all, that it's all. Secrets of Pi work, works on top of CircuitPython, so it'll always work. Oh. Yeah. Um, we could be in, like, you know, Python 12. It'll still work. Okay, so yeah. here's my thoughts on it, though. I always prefer consistency. Right. And personally, settings.toml makes a lot more sense, at least to me, in how it works. Hmm. Like, how it looks and how it works. And that, I, that was a huge part of why I pushed also for the change obviously i wasn't the only one involved there but like i i definitely agreed with it um and i i do get quite annoyed when i run into for example the i think it's um it's either requests or something else i was using recently where it's hard-coded to use secrets.py it, ha um, it has to be like in in the examples anyway it has to be no it was you, in the code oh yeah, I think it was, maybe it you're was talking the, about the portal, the portal base that you know, uh, it was something to. else. It was it was something else because I haven't used Pi Portal in a while, but I don't remember what it was. But it was a recent project, and I was really annoyed because it was it was hard coded into the library itself, not the example that I had to use secrets.py. Um, whatever I was doing was was like gnarly workarounds for some things. So I mean, most people aren't going to run into it, but um, I certainly did. Somebody's going to. Um, and if you're if you're already getting so used to using settings.toml, which is that you know most of the learn guides are, are moving to and so on and so forth, um, it, it's going to be confusing, right? When you run into something that requires secret stop high, which you may not have been exposed to if you only started with Adafruit in the mm -hmm. last month. 
And if um, all the learn guides are already using settings.tom, it'll be the first time that new yes. beginners will will run into it. Yeah. Yeah. All of the examples that are in Adaproot requests currently use secrets.py except for the new ones that I've been contributing, like the Open Sky Network is like the only one I think that uses settings.toml. Okay. Um so I can go through and change all of the API examples. I'm like I'm good with APIs and stuff like that. So I can change all of those to settings.toml. I just need the guidance, should I? Well it, the the thing I'm the thing I'm I'm questioning is um, it what will what you are doing affect guides and or the code itself? It will like absolutely. No, it won't affect the library. It will only affect the guides, at which will force all the guides to then be you know need to be updated to settings.toml instead of having anything to do with secrets.py in the guides. And this is okay. going to affect a lot of guide. Anything that's an online guide, it will affect. I I don't want to get into the portal based stuff and the and the yeah. Pi portal stuff because that's a whole different animal. I'm just talking adfruit requests only. Like that's what I kind of specialize in. So my thought is try to start on the ones that don't require learn guide updates. And if there are any. Um because I I need to I need to like negotiate the learn guide updates on my end. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the only other caveat that I had was that um, there might be some examples in learn guides for like M zeros where settings.toml might not work if web workflow is automatically initialized. So settings.toml <clears throat> for the most part will automatically initialize web workflow as well. Mm -hmm. So we need a way to especially for M0 boards to not have that happen. We need like a default, you know, don't run web workflow with this example kind of thing. Well, I don't that's think we have web, web workflow <laughs> and M0 at all. Like there's no M0 that does web workflow. Okay, well, that solves that. Like um, it's it's going to be on your, all the ESPs that, that will do that. So all the ESPs can handle web workflow in the background, really. Okay, um, here's what I want you to do. Um, and this is silly, kind of, but it's not. Um, please put individual PRs in for each example. And then link in the PR uh, description to the guide it affects. Um, actually, it doesn't matter if you do a bunch at once. Just link, link in the description to all the guides that are affected. And maybe put in the title, say, do not merge yet. <laughs> um, and what that'll do is that'll give me a list because, I mean, I'm going to have to, like, negotiate, you know, arbitrarily or, or vaguely negotiating somebody to update guides is one thing, but having a list of guides to update um, will make it easier because then I can say, hey, you know, here's this list of guides that need to be updated before we merge this or when we merge this. Um, mm -hmm. You know, can you or whoever I pick to do it? Um, does it that would make be sense, easy. Evan? Yeah. Yes. It would be easier on me if I did them individually because oh, it, okay. take, it, it takes you, time do it. to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And time is not something I have a lot of, so I'm just gonna, you know, one at a time kind of. Yeah. Thing. I didn't. And, I didn't want to. I, I wasn't doing it to um, limit you. I was trying to make sure I wasn't limiting you. But if if that okay. actually, if that limitation helps you, take it. Um, um, the the previous examples where I did something recently, you know, where we linked and you said, you know, tag you or Eva, you know, kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. I'm I'm used to that now, so I can I can do that. It's not a problem. Yeah, tag me because I don't know who I'm gonna put this on yet, um, and put and just include do not merge yet in the title, like in all caps. Got it. And uh, that's how we'll do it. We'll just especially if you're doing them individually and and, and they're happening relatively slowly. This will be perfect. I can just find somebody who's got you know a few minutes to change up the guide, um, and then we can merge the thing and and do it all at the same time. It'll be good. Yeah, and this is a good Our, time to do it because we're still quite a far way away from 9.0, but we are working towards 9.0. Mm -hmm. So we're getting to 8.2 here pretty quick. So 9.0 is coming up. What were you going to say, Scott? Yeah. Um, I was going to say, do we have a feeling of how many examples in the in the library 
repo in, in I want to say there's like driver repos are actually used in learn guides versus like the code that's in the learn guide repo right repository yeah um like do we really. have to be scared do we do we have to make sure or well yes because well yes <laughs> yeah, yeah because sometimes uh sometimes Lamore asks for things to be put in the library instead of in the learn repo okay like particular examples that 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 she thinks um having tied into the the repo so if somebody mm -hmm. goes there for the code like having that example there makes more sense right i wonder um, i wonder if this is something we could actually like use ci to do of like this this file is imported into this learn page can you have you checked it or or automatically like post automatically yeah, post on the pr to say like oh this impacts these learn guides I we will should talk be able to, to ask, Justin. Yeah, ask Justin to see like if we if we gave you a file on GitHub, could you tell us what guides it's in? Yeah, and then we could I make will, the um... then we could make the GitHub action like follow up and be like, FYI, this changes this file that's imported here. I've done That'd about really 10, helpful, 10 API examples in the Adapert requests library that are not associated with guides. Basically, anything right. that doesn't have the word API in it is something I've done personally that does not have a guide. But th the rest of them that have, I want to say, Adafruit um, underscore, you know, something that doesn't have API, those I think are all associated with learn guides of some kind. Well, okay. here's 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 the thing. Um, if you change the URL of a file that is linked in Learn, it 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 sends an email to a couple of us that says, "Hey, this embedded link changed. Go fix it." So there might actually be a way to, 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 to have CI be involved. Um, okay. But yeah. I will ask about it. So when it, up, when it updates the embedded content, it does warn you that like the guide. Yeah, like it, it does send, it. there is a signal going out. It's just a question of okay. can we convert that signal to a CI, you know, compatible signal? Well, I'm less concerned if it is, if you are getting notified about it. Um, it's just not something that I had visibility into. Yeah, yeah. I. Yeah, I know I understand, but it's like I said, it's just can we actually convert this to something that CI can use to to pop a message in the PR? We'll find out. Um, yeah. So start it's, start this way because it's obviously you're going low and slow if you're just doing them individually and you're you know check one guide or you know check the guides to see what, whether it's in there, um, and we'll see what we can do to automate the finding whether it affects guides part or not. I had no idea that. Um some of this might be hard-coded in the library. So if you can remember whichever one you encountered, earmark that because that's going to be important. It was definitely not requests. I just opened the Adafruit requests library and did a search for secrets and it's not in there. So uh, requests, you're good to go. Okay. Well, like I said, uh, portal base uh, is affected by that, which affects like uh, that's kind of like the base library for a bunch of different ones, like uh, the Matrix Portal Library, mm -hmm. the PyPortal Library. Yep. Um, there was a ESP thirty two S two TFT library, um, the MagTag yeah. library. Yeah, it's going to cause a nightmare for anything and uh, fun PyPortal and portal believe. base related. Yep. Yeah. No, we're we're not. I think the plan is not to touch that anytime soon. Okay, that's the only like, library I'm aware of where it's embedded in there. There's something. Oh, 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 oh. It's uh, it's ESP32 SPI. Oh, the one uh, foamy okay. guy was just working on. The one what? Foamy guy was just working on that. Yeah, he um, was like part of the the whole thing that foamy guy has been doing is, um, like making the ESP32 SPI be more like, uh, the regular it, ESP32. It, it, request thing yes um it is the esp32 spi library that that has hard-coded secrets in it so and anecdote is while, talking about the wi-fi manager as well yeah while it's on Foamy the same, same library there. okay while foamy guy's in there maybe we can have him take a look into that as well well th then we got to figure out what it what what guys does that affect because that's going to affect like code you know never mind like, I, i'll be quiet <laughs> No, I'm saying no. Eventually, we should. I agree. I'm just saying, like, and that's something that's something Foamy Guy can actually do, like the whole process of. He's he's got access to learn guides, so like, right. that's that's fine. I'm not at all concerned about him going in and making those changes because we don't have to find somebody else to step in and do other parts of it. Um, 
but it's worth mentioning. I will uh, I will also make a note to uh, bring that up if he's in there. Okay, I've got I've got a couple of other things I want to do around this too. First, I want to read just what Anik Data typed in the chat for anybody mm -hmm. who's not watching the chat. So Anik Data said, "Need to make sure we educate users on what what the key fields in settings.tom will do, uh, web workflow or not, Wi-Fi credentials without enabling wi web workflow, and we need to resolve the question of whether you auto connect is made distinct from the web workflow settings." Um, Jeff suggested starting with a very small number, though, which I think we are with just starting with the requests examples. And starting um, with one at a time. Yep. Anic Data said, secrets.py access tends to be the high-level device helper library. Jeff points out about 125 bundle examples seem to use secrets.py, about 106 learn files. Um, is Anic Data says ESP32 Spy Wi-Fi Manager and ESP32 Spy also has enterprise credentials from Secrets. Uh, Maker Melissa says I think the way this will affect guides the most is instead of telling users to add some API keys to Secrets.py, add them to Settings.toml instead. Yeah, and I so think I actually wrote a page, like a separate page, on it. If okay. I didn't, I will, and we can just mirror it in. Sounds good. Um, the other thing I wanted to clarify is when we're talking here about using settings.toml, we're using, we're talking about using os.getenv to actually get the, the values out, right? We're mm -hmm. not talking about yes. a separate uh, toml yeah. parser that, that we have started to talk about, but. Um, uh, no, we're it, it's just... just, it's just for the purpose of, you know, as Melissa said, for, for that and you know, any API accesses will have different type of credentials that you might want to store in secrets or settings.py right. apart from, you know, any web workflow API or, you know, settings.toml right. stuff. Right. So when we're switching over, we're switching over to os.getenv, which is powered uh, for, by yes, settings. Yes, maybe I should have that. specified that instead, yeah. Okay. I, I agree. I agree with that direction for sure. So... Thank you for taking that on, and Katni, thanks for organizing it. Yep. Anything else? I see Jeff is typing. I feel like maybe I shouldn't say people's user's name, because <laughs> on my screen they're, they're ellipsized, so you can't see the full one. Um, Go anyway, ahead, yeah, I'll just repeat what I was typing. I didn't, I would look through the CircuitPython issues real quick, and I didn't uh, find an issue proposing the enhancement to allow settings.toml to uh, configure a Wi-Fi that will automatically be connected to like before code.py starts the first time uh, without starting web workflow. That does sound like an interesting idea that I hadn't. Oh, here it is. It, it's 7598, separate web workflow and auto connect. Um, I think that's definitely something to consider, but it's uh, separate from any of these particular things, I guess. Right, but uh, maybe definitely something to do in nine. Definitely do a nine. What's nice is not paying that reconnection cost every time your code reloads. That's what I would really like. Mm -hmm. However, we accomplish that. Right. And Bill points out at some point we should also try to make it store multiple Wi Fi credentials for portable boards. Because with software implementations, it means no web workflow. And DJ Devin three says yes, that would be preferable to be able to separate them and disable web workflow if possible for a requests only project. I do like the idea of auto connect. Really simplifies um, like example code because so much of the example code is just like getting connected. Let's make sure. Uh, that's yes, right. because for some requests, um, you might have yep. uh, like a settings.toml and a secrets.py for connecting uh, a web workflow plus using secrets.py for request projects. So merging it all into just settings.toml is, is preferable. Mm -hmm. Cool. And it sounds like uh, this issue is marked for 9.0, and the kind of conclusion was that we would only start the web workflow if you gave it an API password. 
if you put an API password in your settings.toml. Yes, it, I think there's uh, like a Wi-Fi password and then an API password. Um, right. I, I could be wrong, but I think that has already been started. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's there. It's just if you don't if you don't set it, the server still starts up and it just gives you errors if you try to do things that are. Uh, okay. Yeah, we need uh, workflow to workflowy. So we could change that. I think the reason I did that is because. Um, you don't want to do the MDNS circuitpython.local unless you have the web server actually running. So we'll have to be a little careful on that. OK. Um, I added another thing in here. Jeff, do we just want to talk briefly about um, the USB keyboard workflow, which I think you were alluding to as well? Yeah. So. With the the Run CPM emulator, um, it was just a matter of oh, I'll patch this one hard coded uh, UART pin into the code, and then it you know worked for my needs. But mm -hmm. that's not um, probably enough for Circuit Python. So, what what was doing the, the way the keyboard from... works is it um, the way the keyboard works that I did is it gets the USB HID and it does all of the the translations. So like applying what shift does or caps lock or control does to the raw key codes mm -hmm. and it manages the key repeat. And so the software just has to treat it as this UART is typing into the console. Right. Um, which is a very and that's low the code that I was just thinking that that was the code that I was just thinking I needed to add circuit to circuit Python. And I think we've got the ability to hard code a UART console in, like for the ESP32 boards. Right. That's essentially how they operate, those without. I, um, yeah, my plan was to treat USB. it as another serial input, right? So, like, there's that one serial read characters or something, mm -hmm. you know, and serial the H, yes. it just has that, like, all those different types you enable. I was just going to add another one that was, like, check to see if there are bytes available from the USB keyboard, right? And, and adjust and it just we, like a serial stream. Would we like have that built into the board definition so it would be just a certain board would have this feature or would it be configurable yeah, I through think, boot.py or settings toml or something? I think it would be, I was, what was I thinking? I was thinking it would be like, um, like Pico DVI. Like Pico DVI is the reverse, right? Like boards can set it up and it just works from the get-go or you can instantiate it and then it works. Um, and so I think it would be a, you either have a board that says I have a dedicated host port or you instantiate USB host and then it works kind of from then on mm -hmm. once USB host is designated. Um, Oh, and, and I guess one the thing other thing is the the pin that I selected is the the one called RX, and so the sender uses a PIO peripheral to create the UART signal. That's not important, but it means we yeah. can do it on whatever feather pin we want, or you know any other pin. Yeah. Uh, with the I mean, I was a controller. Yeah, I was just I was just thinking of it in terms of like just taking input and then putting it into the circuit python i wasn't thinking about like do, bridging it at all um but yeah basically adapting it so that like you just have a usb host serial input which i suppose Are you, you think could... you're thinking about with uh circuit python running on the usb host board right like having okay. native usb hosts so like I would, yeah, RB2040. and I was answering questions about this other thing. Right, but I, like that code that you have to do the mapping from hid report all the way to serial is like exactly the thing that I need, mm. or nearly the thing I need. Um, and I was thinking about it of like how to how to manage like multiple key maps and stuff. Yeah, this um, doesn't do that. It's purely QWERTY. So you. Colomac folks or you people with a European Azerty keyboard are not right. going to be well served by it. Um, is it 
is it code you wrote or yes it's code wh what is it it's code that i wrote there was there was some code that i referred to that um mm -hmm. there's some in tiny usb and there's another one that i found and i identified that it was important to have um caps lock work and it didn't work with those other ones so <laughs> i ended up doing my own implementation okay well, that sounds where I like. I need to start. I imagine that you have some some tables for mapping from from key numbers to to ASCII. Yeah, or I, Unicode. ultimately, that's mostly what it amounts to. Um, because the USB like A through Z are in order, so you right. can have a compressed table by saying A, and the next twenty five characters after that are related. That doesn't right. work once you change to Colomac or Azerty because, right. you know, the, the thing in the Q's position now is Z, so that order is messed up. Right. Um, yeah. Are you are so, you handling, are you producing VT100 codes out of this as well? For the so cursor for like, keys, yeah, there are... Yeah, for like are, cursor and escape. It produces the... the keystroke you would expect for escape for the cursor keys it was doing what cpm what was frequently okay. seen on cpm keyboards which is sending a single uh, keystroke it's actually control h j k l just like vim <laughs> uh, which was an interesting thing to learn so like control h is left is backspace it's all one key and control j is vertical line feed and cursor okay. down and whatever K and L are. So, mm. um, but it, and right now there's no support for sending a string. There's only support for sending a single character, right. but that would be easily changed, I hope. Yeah. Yeah, so that was my, that was my hope. Um, is it, uh, like, that's what I've been thinking about is converting the hidden mm. reports all the way, all the way down to like Unicode serial. Okay, uh, I see. Yeah, that would be cool too. I was thinking to have the coprocessor board. I want to take this same run CPM project and change out the board that has the CPM emulator and the DVI, change out that software for CircuitPython. And so that would be all about having CircuitPython use the the key the, or the ASCII codes that are coming in on the UART RX pin as input. Mm. And that's, that's there. You just have to rebuild for it and... Right. Running but circuit we've... Python on the USB host feather is a different thing. Right. Yeah, but this translation is the shared piece. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that I was thinking about, one thing I did find is um, DJ Devin three points out that Naradoc has a good keyboard layout uh, library, and um, it turns out Naradoc like uh, generates that based on some Windows keyboard layout info. Um, hmm. But I did manage to find like the x.org Linux version. Um, so I think there is a world where we can basically like have a bit packed format of that that you could put dump into boot.py and kind of like I want to replace the query mapping, right? Like I want to replace the query mapping mm -hmm. with a Colmac mapping. And so I'm thinking it's just going to end up being like a byte string. Um, yeah that I, in boot.py I'll just say like no use this keyboard mapping instead um, or use this and I think you have to do it before like doing shift um, I'm not entirely sure and so like figuring looking at how it's done on like Linux was was part of what I wanted to do is just figure out like do you do we need two steps um, because like if your C if your C character moves, your control C is still copy and paste or or break or whatever. So I think different people make different choices about that. What is what is important to them, the position or the legend on the key. Right. Yeah. I I've seen people do both for sure. And so if it's flexible enough, it, I don't know. Yeah. I want it to I be mean, flexible it enough would, that like only non double the size of the table. Sort. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want a bunch of angry Europeans. They will be scathing, but slightly understated about how they feel. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it is safe to assume that this is not going to be on the Sandy Twenty One. 
like I'm doing it on IMX and we'll certainly do it on the RP2040 as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have to be as cautious, I don't think. Um, so yeah, if you could point me to that. Do you, so you don't, you weren't thinking you were going to do it in CircuitPython immediately. No. You were thinking more of the serial you are in to CircuitPython. Right. Yeah. So I wanted to take this existing project and switch it from being a CPM computer to a CircuitPython computer. But the way I have it right. split, the part right. where, where CircuitPython would be running is not the part that's doing the USB host. Right. Well, that would still be really cool if you start working on that and figuring out like what, like the the next step after getting the serial input is actually figuring out like how would you edit a code.py just from that serial input. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the, the big question of like, do we have a editor.py that when you hit escape, it switches to that and things like that. Like how do you toggle between running and editing? Yeah, I, I think Bill has some uh, some software that that could do mm -hmm. that, but the question of how you switch modes and exactly yeah. what happens. Um, I think it's a neat question. I like this editor.py approach a bit because it gives people flexibility to use different editors. Um, yeah, Bill has their own curses implementation. That'd be cool. Um, it's absolutely massive. Yeah, that's the that's the hard part, keeping it small. Um, I like the reason that I wanted to go from keyboard to serial and stream those that then you could actually like prototype slash test from a host computer over serial. Um, right, like if you have escape codes, if you use escape, which is what I've heard people say then you could do it from TI, TIO and do escape, and that would get you through into the editor and stuff too, um, which would be neat. And it sounds like that was what was more interesting to you, Jeff, because you already have this translator from USB host to a serial mm -hmm. out. So if you wanted to play with that, that would be cool. One thing I did want to do is I wanted to have a keyboard icon show up in the status bar when a keyboard. Oh, that would be in. interesting, yeah. Just so that you can tell that, like, oh, if I type in, it's going to go into CircuitPython. Which gets me more deeper into the weeds of, like, how would we support emoji <laughs> characters in Terminal I.O.? Uh, we'll I there. won't be doing that part, sorry. <laughs> It's crossed my mind. But we cheat the snake right now because we just dropped the snake, snake Unicode character that we output. And we just hard code putting it in the top left. Um, OK. Uh, using Unicode and REPL lately for status connections, they stand out and are very helpful. ANSI escape sequence for terminal detection and size, too. Yep, we'll get there. OK, well, uh, Jeff, if you could link me to that code, I might. Uh, start with that. Yeah, and I will grab how, you a link and put that in Discord. Let's see how I can start and start with that. And then I do want to add a thing so that you could, and maybe it's not just be boot.py, but basically make it that table mutable. Uh, like maybe like copy on write or something so that you could remap keys because I won't be able to type in QWERTY. <laughs> um, so I got to think about that. Yeah, our user not. zero needs support for it, so it'll happen. Yeah. Yeah, and it's good for, like, we do have people wanting HID differences, too, right? Like, because they're not US, not US folks, so. And I'm not the only one that would ever need it. <laughs> OK. 104. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, with that, let's wrap up the meeting. Uh, this has been the State of Circuit Python for June 20th, 2023. Thank you to everybody who's taken their time, not only to attend in person, but also if you uh, are listening to this after the fact and you made it all the way to the end, we really appreciate it. 
Um, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython for Adafruit, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for News Microcontrollers newsletter uh, next week. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be next uh, Monday. I'm just pulling it up on my calendar to make sure. Uh, yep, next Monday at the normal time. Uh, which is 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, this meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord server, which you can join by going to the URL adafru.it slash discord. If you want to uh, be notified about the meeting and any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the at CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. With that, we all hope to see you next week, and have a great week uh, right now as well. Thank you all.